Hello folks, this is David Hurley of the Just One Thing community blogging on the Hive blockchain. Now every day on the community, my uh, collaborator Russell Stockley posts a uh, prompt word that we can blog around. It gives us a topic to focus on to make blogging easier to do. And the word that I'm talking about in this video is drama. Now, Drama for, it has had a very important role in my life, not so much from the acting, though I've done quite a bit of acting in my time, you know, amateur stuff at university and all that sort of thing, but in my engagement with uh, the plays of the Renaissance, the English Renaissance mainly, uh, particularly the plays of Shakespeare. And so what I thought I'd do is talk about my approach to engaging with those plays from an academic point of view, uh, really talking about my academic interest and where that comes from. So um, I have a blog, I have several blogs, but this particular blog, David Hurley in Japan, is where I have posted um, some essays that I've written about the plays of Shakespeare. It goes right back to the time when I did my master's degree, which was in English Renaissance literature. So my academic interest is in the English Renaissance. At that time, my main interest was in Francis Bacon, but also obviously studied a lot of Shakespeare. Um, and Shakespeare has eclipsed Francis Bacon over the last couple of decades. I'm particularly interested in what can be revealed in the works of Shakespeare's, Shakespeare's drama, but also his poetry, uh, when viewed from a Machiavellian perspective. Now, what I mean by that is that I think through the plays in a way that I think uh, Machiavelli himself might have done to find what the power structures are in the interactions between the various characters. And in some plays that's much easier than in others because Shakespeare himself uh, engaged with Machiavellian ideas, probably read Machiavelli, was certainly very familiar with the Machiavellian concepts which were uh, very topical during Shakespeare's lifetime. Uh, so I've written some essays uh, on this topic, and I thought I'd just mention them. But before I go through them, I want to uh, talk about this idea of approaching Shakespeare's plays in a Machiavellian manner. Now, one of the ways to do that is to talk to the characters and ask them what they are doing. And this comes directly from Machiavelli's own account of how he engaged with uh, historical texts, which are often very dramatically written and presented, it must be said. Uh, so he, he writes a letter, a very famous letter, to a friend called Vettori, in which he's talking about his time uh, in exile. He's been exiled um, actually onto his own, own farm. He's He's been banished more than exiled, banished to his own farm when there was a change of uh, government in Florence, not in his favour. The uh, Medici came back to power and kicked out the Republicans, of whom Machiavelli was one. If you know that one of his most or his most famous book is called The Prince, it might sound quite surprising that he was a Republican. Why is he writing about how a prince can gain power and keep power if he's a Republican? But that's another story. Let's look at um, what he says about how he engages with the um, texts of the past when he goes back home after spending a day on his farm and playing cards in his village. Uh, he, he gets back home after playing cards and arguing with the locals in the pub. And he says here, when evening comes, I return home and go into my study. At the door, I take off my everyday clothes covered with mud and dirt and don garments of court and palace. Now, I don't do that when I start reading Shakespeare, 
but still, let's get into the spirit of it. Now garbed fittingly, I step into the ancient courts of men of antiquity, where, received kindly, I partake of food that is for me alone and for which I was born, where I am not ashamed to converse with them and ask them the reasons for their actions. And they, in their full humanity, answer me. For four hours I feel no tedium and forget every anguish, not afraid of poverty, not terrified by death. I lose myself in them entirely. And because Dante says, having heard without retaining is not knowledge, I have noted down how I have profited from their conversation and composed De Principatibus, that's the prince, a little study, etc. So the key thing is he engages in a conversation with the, the great men of the past, as it were, and asks them what their motives were, why they acted as they did, and seeks for answers. Now, in my readings of Shakespeare, I try to imagine that kind of process. Uh, so that's one very important aspect of what I do. It's the Machiavellian side. So it's, I have written quite a few essays on this topic. So I begin with um, Machiavelli and Francis Bacon. This is really what uh, inspired uh, this whole process. Incidentally, my professor at York University uh, wrote a book after I had, uh, a couple of years after I'd got my master's degree, not while I was doing it, uh, on Shakespeare and Machiavelli. And so reading that also further, further inspired me in this direction. Uh, while doing my MA, this is another paper I wrote, Imagining Alchemists and Magicians in New Atlantis, the Tempest and the Alchemist. That one's not so much Machiavellian, but it's another one of my interests, which I'll talk about in a minute. But here we come to my, uh, the essays I've written over the last uh, several years. A Moved Prince, The Judgment of Prince Aeschylus in Romeo and Juliet. This is a very Machiavellian look at whether the judgment of the prince was a good judgment or not. In fact, it leads to disaster because he is too lenient. A lecture on Shakespeare and Machiavelli. It's a lecture I gave an introduction to where you can find Machiavelli and his ideas in the plays of Shakespeare. Uh, the Politics of Occasion in King Lear, so Machiavellian practice versus uh, Lipsian constancy. Lipsius was a, a Dutch Stoic. Fratricide or the killing of brothers in Hamlet, a Machiavellian perspective. So you can see this theme, this Machiavellian theme coming through the dramas of Shakespeare. Two parts of a single motif. This one is a bit more complex. There is some Machiavellian aspects talking about Othello. I mean, Othello is so obviously Machiavellian with the, the uh, great wicked character of Shakespeare's plays, Iago, plotting and planning to overthrow Othello. We have three problematic heroines, Machiavellian prudence and integrity in Shakespeare's problem plays. Then we have The Tempest and the Mask. Now, this one I will come back to in a moment. And the, the last one I wrote was Telling Timely Tales, Paulina's Politic Deception, very Machiavellian theme, in one of Shakespeare's late plays, The Winter's Tale. So now there is this Machiavellian interest that I have, but as, uh, alongside that, there is uh, another interest which may seem a bit strange, but it comes from the same period, Italy, Florence, during the Renaissance. Um, contemporary with Machiavelli was a very different thinker called Marsilio Ficino. And he was a humanist philosopher and a reviver of Neoplatonism, uh, well, a reviver of Plato and Neoplatonism. He translated uh, Plato. Uh, and is very influential in our own understanding of Plato even today. So we have these two very different thinkers. Uh, Marsilio Ficino was uh, an astrologer, 
though he had to take care in how he defined his astrology. He was a, a Catholic priest. And then we have Machiavelli, the uh, political realist. Now, how I put these two together is like this. I consider myself it's somewhat in opposition to the uh, default setting of the typical university educated twat of these days, who in politics is an idealist, but in philosophy is a materialist. I am in the opposite camp. I am not a political idealist. I am not a utopian. Uh, I am, along with Machiavelli, a political realist. But in philosophy, along with Marsilio Ficino, I am an idealist. So I call myself a philosophical idealist and a political realist, whereas the people of this benighted generation are, for the most part, the opposite. They are political idealists and philosophical materialists. So I do believe that is a phase that is going out with new thinking. So I put these two things together, these two aspects, philosophical idealism and political realism, when I come to the dramas of Shakespeare and also his poetry. Um, in many plays, it's, more, it's much easier to do so than in others, but... Whereas my my professor, uh, John Rowe, uh, went for the, this is not a disparaging term, but the more obvious political plays of Shakespeare to find uh, Machiavellian influences and discuss them, such as the history plays, you know, the plays of kings and the Wars of the Roses, uh, all that sort of thing. Um, I have found Machiavellian influences in some of the comedies, um, the problem plays, uh, such as this one here, uh, the female characters engaging in various Machiavellian um, deceptions and, and contrivances in, for example, the plays Measure for Measure, All's Well That Ends Well, and Troilus and Cressida. So, this, I feel, is a rich seam of inquiry, and uh, it's what has engaged me for the last few years. I must admit, I've, I've not written very much recently. Uh, my focus has actually shifted from the dramas of Shakespeare to uh, one of his early poems, which is The Rape of Lucrece, where we can find some Machiavellian motifs, to be sure. Anyway, I thought I would just give you a little bit of insight into what my primary academic interest is in relation to uh, Shakespeare's drama. That's it from me for today. David Hurley blogging on the Hive blockchain through the Just One Thing community.